So to me, uh, it's, it's quite important that we take this as a kind of a discovery tour of, um, of Estonia. I mean, the, when I was in Estonia last year, there was this big discussion about how much of the country will go organic. And, you know, and they're setting their objectives. Let's go for 50% organic. And some people said, oh, that's way too much. And, of course, I came in and said, why, why not 100%? I mean, why ever settle for less than 100%? Um, but in order to go through these kind of reflections, what we're in need of is a discovery of what is there and a discovery of what was there. And if we are ready to embark on this path of discovery, we're going to find things that are quite amazing, quite surprising, quite uh, interesting. And so my, my goal is not really to make a formal presentation to you because you've had more than enough of that. Um, my goal is really to enter into a dialogue, particularly with the Estonians who specifically came for this session. Who are they? Okay, I'm just seeing the seats here in the back. Yes, thank you. And there as well. Okay, great. So, I know you come from big corporations like uh, telecommunications, like Telia, and uh, I know you have uh, Ericsson here, and I know you have a water company, and I know you have your power companies, and I know you have your bio market. I mean, I looked at the companies that are participating, and of course it is very interesting to, to see that you have a mix of both entrepreneurial people, government people, advisors, large corporations, smaller corporations, and it's that blend uh, that uh, makes it very attractive to discover because, let's be honest, the solution is not only with the entrepreneurs, the solution is not only with the big corporations, the solution is not only with the government. I mean, it has a solution of everyone everywhere all the time and it's that integration that we have to look for. And therefore, I would like to ask those who are not from Estonia, when you think of the country, what do you think the country has? Forest. Forest, yes, give me a pen. Anyone has a big pen? Oh, oh I, I hear someone already jumping in there. You, you, you heard me before. So if you have a forest and everyone recognizes a forest, I, I, I hear, who said the yeast? Who said it? I mean, you immediately say yeast because you've been contaminated by my way of thinking. <laughs> and so the big why is there. Now, why is this important? Because any biologist will always... Yes? Um, the forest makes brash that cuttings off the, off the timber, and that brash is lying in heaps all over here, and that's perfect fuel for a Barossa stove, and you've got your biochar. Yes, so there is a source for biochar, there is a source for a lot of things. I mean, you're collecting your mushrooms. You're Estonians, you love collecting your mushrooms, although I hear you're collecting less and less because it's easy to go to the store and just buy it. I mean, last night I had extraordinary mushrooms that were fermented uh, uh, at home as it used to be done. Of course, you like your berries. So I'm not going to put the finger on what you already know and what you have done, we're looking at the new ones like the biochars, we're looking at the yeasts. Now, does anyone here know how you harvest yeasts? Who has harvested yeasts? Yes, how do you do it? Just put the open uh, hand outside. You just put it, yeah, th th then you're very patient. Then you have a few... Um, fruits. Yes. Fruits and, some water. And, after a while, and it's in there. You know, isn't it embarrassingly simple? And, and how do you do it? Someone else said? I give them some food, and they give will food? latch onto anything. They latch onto anything. So how many... How many varieties of yeast do you know you use at home? Three. Well, you should use hundreds, and they're wildly in your kitchen probably hundreds, but how many are industrially used in your food? Industrially used in your food. Which ones? Hefen, yeah. Yeah, of course, for the beer, you need yeast for the beer, and... 
and in bread. So, in wine. So, if you have beer, bread, and wine, do you think you have it at home? I mean, I think we have two, right? So, what is happening? I would always immediately ask myself the question, who today is supplying that to the market? I mean, that's the question we have to ask, because it is very clear that if we're making reflections, we have to know, is there a demand? Now, I'm not interested in the demand for apps for Apple computers. I'm interested in demand for basic things we need. And do we agree that fermentation is something we need? I mean, could we ever live without fermentation? Probably not. Anyway, and if you have enough fermenters in your food before you eat it, your tummy will take care of the rest of the fermentation, either through indigestion or a good digestion. Okay? So what we know is that there is a basic need in our food, in our society, to actually improve the varieties of yeast. Because the yeast is an important component of our immune system. So if it's an important part of your immune system, you don't want to depend on three companies that make 15 types of yeast for 98% of all the yeast that are industrially used around the world. That's insane. Now I'm translating that negative feeling into a, a great opportunity. Hey, if it's that easy as uh, some people here say you can do with yeast, why aren't we doing that? Are you doing it in Damanhur? Somebody, okay. So, give me the name. Yeah. So, what, what I would like to see, you eco-villagers, you should be the pioneers of the yeast because you all preach about fermentation. But I'm wondering if you, how much are you paying for a little bag of that little yeast? I mean, you're buying it usually by 10 grams, eh? 5 grams, a little sachet. How much are you paying? 1 euro. One euro for five grams. Can you imagine? Let's translate that into two tons. Are you ready? <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, are we in agreement? One euro, five grams. No, 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 no. Someone is making a lot of money. I mean, I would like to translate. Someone is making an awful lot of money. Why don't... I mean, are all your eco villages fully funded? Do you have excesses of cash laying around? I mean, do you make ends meet every month uh, easily? And this is where we have to start from. It's something everyone uses. It's a symbol of biodiversity. The precondition is a healthy forest. Well, aren't we in Estonia? How many business models have been written for yeast that you know in Harvard Business Review? None. Who is the master of yeast and the enzymes of yeast in this European context? One company. Danish. Novo Nordisk. They are the masters of genetic manipulation of yeast. Oh, we thought they were green companies. They're Danes. Well, you know, hey, Danes, they can do that as well, huh? So what we have to realize is that there's a very few suppliers, very restricted number of um, varieties, and your forest, I guess that if we can talk to the experts in the fields, they will identify without any difficulties a thousand varieties of yeast. A thousand. Now, we have to do with the yeast what we have done with the goats we have to domesticate them. So yeast needs to be domesticated. So you need to know how to... Do, do you know how to domesticate yeast? Because if you do it in your pot, you get fresh ones all the time. Right? But you're a very patient person. If I am going to make loaves of bread for a, for a thousand people every day, then I probably better have a good of reserves of yeasts around every day. And I can't just be bad luck today because the yeast didn't come today. Because it depends on your sugars. You don't have sugars around, they don't come. They definitely don't stay. I'm taking this only as an example. But I am suggesting that if you're looking at the industries of the future, you're looking at industries where you know there is no risk of getting involved. Because we know that for thousands of years we've been using yeast. And if you have done the great 
miraculous effort to preserve 50% of your land in forests, this seems to be an obvious one. Are we together? Does this make sense? That means kind of or it means... Yes. yes, exactly, yeah. So what I think is important, this is the approach we take to all the opportunities we take one after the other. So you said forest. What's the second one you think of when you are looking at Estonia and you come from the outside? Sea, 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 sea. So my dear Estonians, could you tell me how many kilometers of coastline do you have? 1,500. 1,500, is that a straight line or is that doing all the curves? Oh, the curvy ones. So you, you're the curvy ones. And what about all your islands? Have you added your islands, all the coastlines of all your... How many islands do you have? Over 2,000. Over 2,000. I heard 1,500 before. So get your statistics right, please. I mean, 500 difference is quite a few islands, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm a Belgian. We have no islands. So, 2,000. So if we were to add the coastline of 2,000 islands, how many kilometers of coastline do we have now? 3,000 kilometers? Yeah, just give me a good guess. Now, what do you do with 3,000 kilometers of coastline? Enjoy. Ah, get some cancer. Of course you can enjoy it, and particularly in the winter, right? You, you go out and swim in the winter. So, what, what comes to your mind when you think coastline? Seaweeds. And did, the, did you ever do anything with seaweed? Yes. What? You're using it today for a salad? And there is enough supply in the shops? No, 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 no. So, what did you use the seaweeds for? Fertilizer. fertilizer. You still use it as a fertilizer? Yes. How many tons are you using? If you, if you have 3,000 kilometers of coastline, how many tons of seaweeds do you think will be close to the coastline? Yeah, it depends on the coastline. Depends. Yeah, but give me a number. <laughs> depends doesn't exist. Uh, see, you have lost count. Isn't this amazing when you make an analysis of the opportunities of your country and you lost count? You don't know anymore? When was the last time seaweed was on the news? A few weeks ago. Oh, yesterday. <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, so, so, so what was the latest news about seaweed? It's smelling. It's smelling. It's stinky on the beach. God, we don't like it. Clean it up. Put it on the landfill. Isn't that the kind of things we are discussing? I mean, isn't this amazing? 30, 40 years ago, it was considered to be Weren't you one of the largest producers of seaweeds in the good old Soviet Union? And, 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 and what were the Soviets doing with this? They made gels out of it, and what did they do with the gels? Where did it go? Marmalades! Oh, you were making marmalades with seaweeds. That's interesting. And today? Also. There's one company. And how many thousands of employees do they have? Five employees? Three? Okay. And you have 3,000 kilometers of coastline and you have five employees doing marmalade? So there is one, uh, one startup to produce a much mat for gardening. One startup. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry I'm pushing you, but those international people flying in, they say you got the sea and you got seaweed and you're doing nothing with it. And the only excuse you have is you have three people employed by a startup company that makes some marmalade. I don't think this is a vision for 2035. I think we can do better. You know, this is what we're in need of. We need to identify what are these incredible things that seem to be quite obvious. What would you do with seaweed? Um, if you use the brash from the forest in a pyrolysis stove, you could dry the seaweed and sell it as a dried fertilizer, and you would still produce your carbon to sequester in the soils, which could go with the residue from your seaweed. So, 
Here is a technique on how to dry it in a very cheap way. Do we want to dry seaweed? Well, if you want to ship it around the place and get Do it... Do we want to ship things around? We want to move it inland and it's stupid moving water. I agree with that, but how far do we want to ship things? Especially if it's smelly. If you bring it out, dry it, it's no longer smelly and you can ship it. And what else can we do if, if we don't want to get the energy in to dry it? What else can we do with it? We can? Make ethanol. Ah, we can make energy. Oh, oh, oh. And for that, you need who? You need? Yeast! Oh, uh, the yeast is not, never going to get rid of us, huh? <laughs> or we're never going to get rid of yeast. Don't we forget that the biggest market for fermentation is the ethanol market, is the energy market where we need a lot of yeasts, and that is about 15% of the world market of yeast? Any biomass that has uh, sugars in it can be fermented. You can do alcohols and you can do other things. You can alcohols, methanols, ethanols, all these oils. You know, you can make that and the oil needs fermentation. So what is interesting is we're starting to see a link between the sea and the energy. Where do you get your energy from now? Uh, do, do you dare to say it to us here in Estonia? Where do you get your energy from? Coal, it's called. What? Uh, well, don't, don't, don't shame on anyone, right? Those who claim that they're the cleanest and the best in the world, please step forward. I will have to take a step back. So, how, how much is it? 85%, 6%, 70%, 87% coal energy? So, when it drops, we're enjoying coal here. Or is this coming from renewable sources at this eco village? No. Oh. Wouldn't it make sense that eco villagers pioneer this? How far is the closest source of seawater? From here, straight line. 40 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Not too close. What if we were to ferment seaweeds and we're making what now? When you ferment, you're making either an alcohol or you make a gas. Where do you get your gas from, if I may ask? Or oh, from Russia, from your friendly neighbors. It's very generous to support the Russians, you know. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I know they will very be very grateful to you to continue um, the purchase agreement, right? Wouldn't you kind of like to have your own gas? Wouldn't it be kind of nice to have your own gas? Possibly, yeah. You, I mean, you're politically correct. Uh, you wonder if someone is listening here, right? <laughs> you know, we, 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 so, so if we can have gas, if we can have gas from seaweed, then we need to harvest it, right? But how were they harvesting it before? I mean, the old Soviet times, how was it being harvested? You probably just had some boats, some ships, you haven't... By hand! Oh, we shouldn't do that anymore by hand, or should we? What's the unemployment rate in the fishermen villages here? How many islands are fully populated, or how many islands are depopulating? All your islands are fully populated? No, they depopulated during the Soviet time. So... People are moving to where? To Tallinn. Moving out of the islands. Violence is only for the weekends, right? For most of the people. Or for the Germans who come. For the German tourists. Who pay Airbnb 35% to be able to get a house. Is this the economy you want? I don't think so. So what I'm trying to say is that let's start linking up and this is what I would like to happen and see happen in the workshops, is you start discovering the sea, and then you have this weed. But here we see a first interesting connection. That yeast and that weed together, and actually the word weed is the absolute wrong word. Weed means we human beings don't know what to do with it. You know, it's, when we say weed, we're expressing our ignorance about the opportunities. We have to change our language. If we don't change our language, we don't see the opportunity. So the sea, we, the sea plants, 
are extraordinary, we can immediately have a captive market for our yeast. But if we're going to do gas, how much do we need? How much gas do you consume? Estonians? No one in marketing here? No one in sales? Only in the spirits and in the culture? I mean, in the end of the day, you're buying the products, you better know how much gas is this village consuming. If we combine all the people of your influence in Estonia that you know that is in this room, what's the guess of the cubic meters of gas you're consuming and buying every year from Russia? You would be surprised. And we call that a captive market. It's going to be millions of cubic meters. And how are you going to produce it now? Can we imagine some digesters? You know digestions, right? I mean, if you're in Nickel Villages, you know how to do digestion. You know how to do the six chamber digestion, the 12 chambers. You know how to do the hydrolysis. You know all of that. So would we, would we please use that knowledge of the Echo Village network in order to get some digesters going and using seaweed, which is in abundance because it beaches and now it stinks? And the only thing you can imagine is putting it in a landfill so it stinks somewhere else. And so that we are ensuring good amount of methane gas in our environment. Because seaweed that is decomposing is generating methane. And methane shouldn't be going up in the air. It should be getting into our gas flasks to cook. Does this make sense? And don't you think you have a competitive advantage, if I may use that language, of the business mind? Isn't this a competitive advantage that you know, first of all, how the fermentation works? Two, you know that you can get the, the yeasts. Three, that you have a market. What's the risk of this initiative? What's the risk? The risk is doing nothing. And this is what we have to see as the opportunities before us, because we now only talked about forests and the sea. And we're already going into major shifts in the economy. How do you finance this? Where is the money coming from? Because in the end of the day, mm -mm, cash is needed. Money makes the world go around. We like it, we don't like it. It's a reality. Create your own currency, please do. Margaret Kennedy was the master of it. But we need to understand that there has to be some kind of a money flow. But if I have gas, do you think the Russians sell gas by the day? Or do you think there's some underlying contract that's a little bit longer than a day? We all know that these are long-term contracts, otherwise they wouldn't build the pipelines and they will not maintain the pipelines. So, if you have a couple millions of cubic meters that you and your network of friends are all consuming, can you actually imagine that someone signs up for 10 years? Can you imagine someone pays a little advance to have the right to do this? I mean, this is what we do all the time, right? So what I'm trying to say to you is you have incredible opportunities and you just need to ground it with passion, not with money, with passion. Because once you see these opportunities, you see chances to generate actually a lot of jobs. What's your unemployment rate? How many young people under 26 are without a job in Estonia? Very small. How many? 5%. How many? Thousands. Thank you. Even if it's small relatively in absolute numbers, do you tolerate thousands of young people without a job? We shouldn't. So what I'm trying to say is we're now framing our logic of the market. Because if we say, oh, it's very low, it's only 5%, yes, that's because you compare yourself with Spain, where it's 50%. Why don't you compare it with Las Gaviotas you heard yesterday about, where it's zero? Not one young person is without a job. And no young person should have capacities which we decide as a society that it's okay to have only 5% unemployed. That is not okay in my economic model. So we need to have the creative minds that when we see these opportunities, we have transformation of our societies. And the transformation of society, amongst others, means everyone has a great contribution to make all the time. Isn't this what eco-villages do? Isn't it an eco-village? Do you like to have people who do nothing at all? 
then they're not a member of the village anymore. Is this one of your principles? Now, isn't this great for society? And therefore, isn't the responsibility to be creative enough to imagine the things that you have based on your natural and your cultural history in order to have something that you need every day? It's in the end of the day. It's needed every day. I'm not saying you can't develop apps anymore and you can't do a new Skype anymore and I'm not saying you shouldn't do anything with Spotify. I'm not saying that. But I'm only saying is that there are opportunities that are laying around that are so obvious that it doesn't make sense not to do anything with it. And that is strategy 2035. It's translating the multiple opportunities you see and translating that into action that actually is desired by the large majority of the people. How many Estonians will be in favor of having gas supplied from Estonia? All. All. Would it have multi-party support? Yes, I think so. Do you think that when there is an opportunity to generate a couple thousand jobs with yeasts, that brings the biodiversity of your extraordinary forests to the markets of Europe and beyond, do you think this would have a broad political support? Particularly since every home used to use yeasts to ferment the mushrooms and to ferment uh, your veggies, and you know, because that's what you used to do, all of you. And so building on your culture and your tradition, we have to find the niches where a small nation like yours actually can become visible in the world. Visible. And when you're visible, you have pride. When you're pride, you have motivation. When there's motivation, you move mountains without making a great effort. And this is the transformation of the vision of economic development we need. It's not about having an economic development agency that is looking for the multinational that will set up shop here. I wish you good luck. Because you will need to do a lot of lobbying and a lot of subsidies to get it. And a lot of tax advantages given. But what we're in need of is to build on what we have. Identify those resources. And starting just with the forest and the sea, we immediately have this opportunity to identify concrete steps. Someone agrees. Thank you. Are you in agreement? You think it's a good idea? Yeah? Yeah, the head goes up and down, so I don't know. So, ladies and gentlemen, what else is here in the country? If you have energy and you're using coal, it's going to take a few years before we get this fixed. So what is the first reactions we do short term? We should. Save energy. Shouldn't we get energy efficiency in place? I mean, isn't this one of the great ideas? The negawatts, you remember Amory Lovins 20 years ago with the negawatts? I mean, could we do a bit of negawatting in Estonia? And one of those uh, negawatting would be that we replace those, um, those lamps with lead lamps. They are they lead? They're so hot? Or is it the air that's hot? Those lamps... I want anyone to stand up and try to feel the heat. I can feel the heat right here. Why? Because lamps, even the LED lamps, are still producing too much heat. Somehow our engineers don't get their minds around it well enough and we're using power and the power is converted into light and heat. It's going to take a couple more years before we have the new LED lamps that will have 99% light and only 1% heat. In the meantime, we're wasting it. That's why the design of the lamp has to be such so that we can get rid of the heat. I mean, this is part of our bad design. And we've known it for 100 years and we still haven't resolved it. This is quite amazing, isn't it? So now we see these new lights coming on the market, which are LEDs. Do you like or don't like LEDs? What's your opinion? Who does not like LEDs? Why? Yes, the blue. The blue makes us think it's day, day and night. I mean, this is ridiculous. At night we think it's day because we put on a light that it gives us the blue that is like the sky. But we're 
saving energy. Isn't that good? So when you like LEDs, why do you like the LEDs? Because they're beautiful? Or because they're efficient? You're saving energy. But once you have a LED, there's some people here from Ericsson and Telia. Let me see hands. I'm not going to pick on you. Okay, I promise not to pick. I will be very nice. So when you're in data communications today, what is your data means of communication today? What do you use, all of you? Light? You're using? You need, you're using optical fibers as the backbone, I hope. And then you're connecting to a wireless. Wireless is using what? It's using radio waves. What is the effect of radio waves on our cells? It's confusing the cells. We have to be careful what I say, otherwise I get sued again. So, we know that cells have an effect, that, that are affected by radio waves, and that's why the European Council has now issued this very interesting advice that we should never have more than 620 millivolts or 0 0.6 volts of intensity of radio wave per square meter. May I ask you how many cell phones are in this room? Would you please lift your hand if you have a cell phone? So I guess we are here at about 100 volts. The intensity of the radio waves must make your brains go berserk. And we know it does. So one of the big problems of 5G, which is coming to Estonia when? Already working. Yesterday. <laughs> Testing is gone, it's on. 5G, what do you have to do? Add more antennas, right? Because the G3 doesn't work on the 5G. So we're going to double our exposure to radio waves. So our cells get a bit more confused, maybe, maybe. It's not proven. The proof will be in the pudding in 25 years when we know it is really true and then it's too late for a generation. That's why in the European Union we have these precautionary principles. So ladies and gentlemen, I am now stopping my negative and my critique and my waking up call. I'm going over to the other side. When you have light, what was one of the greatest inventions of Graham Bell? You remember Graham Bell? He invented the telephone. But when he was dying, he was saying that he invented something else he liked much more, and that was the photophone. He thought that the future was communicating over light. He actually had an 800 meter proof of concept where he solely used the sun to transmit data over light. How come they don't teach that at school anymore? I mean, this is fascinating, isn't it? Just using light? I mean, uh, excuse me, I, you don't have to be a religious person, but you remember the book called Genesis? And you know what the first, first words of God were? Let there be light. Oh, 1.3. Gosh, this guy, the first words he said, let there be light, and we never figured out what light he meant. Because apparently, if you look at the new latest technologies, it is light that is going to be our communication channel. I know that uh, France Telecom, uh, I know that uh, Orange, they're working on light communication systems without radio waves for one terabit per second. W what is your 5G? Excuse me? What's the transmission speed of 5G? Will you get to one gig per second? 100 gig in ideal laboratory circumstances. With the only one using the antenna. Because as soon as you get a couple more people using the antenna, you don't get it anymore. So, what we're realizing is that there is a light frequency that allows us 
to transmit data, which today, European funded research institute puts in 2022 the one tera per gig. That is quite impressive. Estonia has always been looked upon as the country that is so much in the forefront, right? In this world? Are, are you in this light technology also in the forefront? Yes, we are. The one Estonian company is working with Japanese guys already for three years from that. Yes. And, and, and one company with how many people? Uh, in, the, in the company, maybe five. Five, five people? Okay. okay. <laughs> it's a startup. It, it is a great startup, and I agree, it's a wonderful startup. But you should be having that in your 2035. Estonia should be the first country that only has data transmission over light with a little backup by Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi does a little backup. Because you have a great network of fiber optics, yes or no? And are you doing power over cables, optic cables? Ah, why not? Because that is a great standard. It's the most energy efficient standard we know today. If you're installing fiber optics, then you actually have an incredible capability to start producing a housing system where you've eliminated all copper wiring. You don't need copper wires anymore. You just need your fiber optics. You have the fiber optics already. Yes, but uh, I, I hope you're still building a few new houses in the future. And I hope your new research centers will be equipped this way. So what I'm trying to say is that we're having the vision to 2035. Could we have the combination? Five minutes. Could we have the combination of the new transmission of data, which is over light, which is using an existing light structure, which is the most abundant infrastructure in the world? We use what we have. Remember the principle of the blue economy? Use what we have. If you're able to use all light, do you turn on the lights at night on the streets? That means those lights equipped with these new systems will be the backbone of the internet. We have it already in France. The first ones are equipped. And that is not a five-persons company. We're talking about thousands of people going to be working on this. We're equipping hospitals where the Wi-Fi is eliminated because Wi-Fi in a hospital creates interferences between the different medical equipments. And we don't want a dripper to drip too much because it was an interference. And when we want people, when they come into the hospital, we want to find the room of the patient so we have a GPS with light that is one centimeter precise instead of the GPS with a satellite that is always 10 meters wrong. And what can we do when we have this kind of a new light guidance guided GPS? Well, we need less hospitals, thank you. That was nice to say. What is one of the great things we will be able to do? We will finally be able to guide the visually impaired people with their phone because they will be guided by light. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the kind of revolutions we need to think of. That's the kind of mindset we need to have. So I only use three, that is, let's call it just the internet, but I would like to give that as the introduction to your mindset and how far can you shift it. I don't want to be speaking at you for three more hours. I want you to have opened up that mind and see that if we're only talking about forest, about the sea and about the internet and about the communication technologies that are emerging around it. And I'm so delighted there are people who know this exists. But why don't we translate we know it exists to Estonia being the number one in the world to do it. Thank you.